Tali, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thank you for having me. Help us further understand this idea of the optimism bias. Can you define it for us? It's our tendency to imagine the future to be better than the past and the present and to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing positive events and underestimating the likelihood of experiencing negative events. What are the consequences of having an optimism bias as well as what are the the benefits of having it? Having these positive expectations of the future means that your mental health is better and good mental health is related to good physical health. The other thing, it enhances your motivation and it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But of course there's a downside, right? If I don't take precautionary action, then I might. Yeah, fam, you know how we here at Young and Profiting love to learn more about how our brains work and how we can harness their innate potential to improve our lives, relationships, and endeavors. Well, today we have a very special guest and someone who spent her life learning more about how our brains help us navigate the world and especially the other people we encounter around us. Professor Tally Sherritt is a neuroscientist and the director of the Effective Brain Lab. She's a professor of cognitive neuroscience in the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University College of London, and she's also on the faculty of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. She's the author of two very popular and influential books, The Optimism Bias and The Influential Mind. Today, we're going to talk with Professor Sherrod about everything from the ways we're hardwired to be optimists to what determines how and if we are able to influence others. Tali, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. I am very excited for today's show, but before we get into all your work about optimism and influence, I want to understand how you got started with the topic of optimism to begin with. So I heard that it was originally sparked by accident. You were living in New York City years ago, and uh, tell us how you first got interested in the topic of optimism. Um, Yeah, so I was doing my PhD uh, in New York City at NYU. And I was studying emotional memories, specifically traumatic memories. How do we remember the traumatic events? Um, And while I was doing this, 9-11 happened in New York City. Um, And so we studied people who were on the island doing the attacks. After the fact, we studied their uh, memories while we recorded their brain activity to kind of see what, what is the difference between these memories of really arousing traumatic events and just memories of everyday events. Um, and then I, so I completed my PhD and I went to do a short postdoc at Harvard. Um, and when I got there, I saw that people were studying how we imagine future events, which I thought was really interesting. And I was thinking, well, it'll be interesting to see if what I found so far about how we remember traumatic emotional events is similar in terms of how the brain works and brain mechanisms to how we imagine traumatic negative events that can happen to us in the future. So I started to do an experiment um, and the experiment was quite simple. I had people describe negative events that could happen to them in the future. I gave them a prompt. For example, I said, imagine the breakup of a romantic relationship, right? Negative event. Um, And I was going to look at um, their imagination and what happens in the brain. But what I found was that a lot of people, what they tended to do when I asked them to imagine these negative events, they switched them into positive events or, Mm. you know, negative events that they're managed to um, correct in some ways. So, for example, if I said, imagine the breakup of a romantic relationship, someone said, I broke up with my girlfriend and then I found a better one. Um, Or if I said, uh, imagine that you're stuck of your apartment and you don't have the keys. And so someone said, okay, I'm stuck. I don't have the keys. I call the landlady. She comes in. She lets me in, right? So they kept doing these things. And even I also wanted to compare this to just imagining just, you know, boring regular events in the future. But what happened there was, again, people twisted those boring events to make them kind of like magical. So I said, imagine getting a haircut in the future. And someone said, I imagine getting my hair cut and donating the hair to Locks of Love was a charity for kids with cancer. And then I went to celebrate with all my friends in my favorite restaurant. So these boring events in the future seem to be so, uh, you know, magical. And the negative events are things that we can solve. So this was not good for my study because how am I going to look at what happens in the brain when you imagine really negative events if you're not imagining negative events, right? This was a problem. And I tried all sorts of different prompts and so on. 
And it took me a while, which now seems a little bit funny, but at the time, um, it took me a while to, to realize that actually, this is super interesting. It's perhaps more interesting than what I originally set out to study. What's going on? Um, so I started looking into the literature and it turns out that in this separate field, which I wasn't really kind of uh, knowledgeable about at the time, behavioral economics, there was a whole literature about this thing called the optimism bias, which is people's tendency to imagine the future as better than the past or the present. Um, mm. And their tendency to imagine the likelihood of positive things happening more than they actually are probably will and kind of discounting the likelihood of experiencing negative events. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. So that kind of that study turned into the study of optimism bias, which led to a lot of, of studies later on. Yeah, that's super interesting. And something that I want to dig on is going back to when you were talking about you being in New York with the 9-11 attacks. From my understanding, you also did a study where you you were trying to analyze people's memories. And what happened was, is that 11 months later after the attacks, people remembered the event differently than what actually they had mentioned when they first told you their memory of the event. So can you talk to us about how their memories changed why, and why you think their memories changed? Yeah. So we actually didn't test them um, at two points in time, but but other people did. Oh. Okay. Um, we just tested them later on. But um, in other studies, um, it has been shown that these memories for traumatic events, including 9-11, um, they're not as accurate as we think they are. And to some extent, this is not surprising because like, uh, no, you know, when you think about your memories, if I ask you like what you did 11 months ago and I even if I say, oh, you know, it was it was June and you were on holiday and, you know, can you tell me about what happened on Tuesday? And you're not going to remember it very well. Right. Or you'll tell me some story, but probably what you're saying is not quite right. It's not exactly the people that you said were there. So in some ways, like the fact that memories are not an accurate representation of what happened is not surprising. But the reason it's surprising in this case is that when it comes to these really emotional events like 9-11, we believe that our memories are really accurate. When we kind of mm. relive them, it feels like a videotape that you're just pressing play and it just happens. So it feels like I remember every single thing, what I was wearing, what I was smelling, what I was hearing. But turns out they're not actually more accurate than everyday events. Or at least if they are, they're not that, much, you know, there's a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, but the difference is they feel accurate. And, and that's a difference, right? When things, when you remember emotion, it's not just negative, it's positive as well. If it's your, you know, someone's wedding day or the birth of a, a child or, a, you know, the breakup of a relationship, these kind of emotional memories that stay with us, a car accident. When we think back to these both very positive and very negative events, it feels like we're just experiencing at it as it is. And so we believe it is, but in fact, it's not. Every time you come up with a memory and emotional memories, we come up with a lot. We retrieve them and relive them a lot. We're changing them a little bit. Mm. Right? Every time we think about whether it's like our wedding, every time we think about that day, we're changing the memory a little bit because we're kind of retrieving it. But now we're thinking about it in an a new perspective because now, you know, we're older, different things happen. And so that changes a little bit. So next time you're retrieving something, that's not quite what happened and so on and so on forth. But we're not, we're, we don't realize that, that that is the case. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting to think about. And what I'm curious about is how memories evolved from an evolutionary standpoint. Memories, are they really about remembering the past or do they help us do something else? Right. So I guess, you know, if we go back to what I said at the beginning that I was studying memory and then I, and then I was, well, it's interesting to study imagination. And there was a whole kind of literature coming up saying, well, in fact, there's a, load, a lot of overlap between how you imagine the future and how you remember the past. Because in order to imagine the future, you have to retrieve memories, right? If I asked you, please imagine your next uh, vacation, you're going to kind of come up with memories from your past vacations, maybe vacations of other people, things that you've seen on TV, and you're going to piece in these little pieces of information to create something you, you on the beach having a cocktail, right? But really, this imagination of something new is basically kind of like a puzzle of old things put together in a new way. So if you think about it like that, that is what memory is for. Memory is 
in order to enhance and enable us to predict the future, to plan the future, right? That's why we have our memories. And if you look at the brain system that's important for memory, including a region called the hippocampus, which is very important for memory, um, those are exactly the same regions that are activated when you imagine the future. Mm. We really have our memory, not so we can like reminiscent of what happened in the past, but in order so we can plan ahead. Um, and, and if we can plan ahead, we can survive better, right? We can be prepared for what's about to come. Yeah. And so would you say that we tend to remember positive events more than negative events that happen in our lives? Um, well, it turns out that it's not uh, that you remember more positive or negative. What's really important is how arousing it is, how strong, how salient, mm. right? So if you have a very, very positive event, you're going to remember it, you know, very vividly. And if you have a very, very negative event, you're going to remember that very vividly as well. So um, it's really about this kind of arousal response that, mm. that we have. Now, it turns out that it seems to be in life, while we do have very arousing positive events happening to us, the negative ones tend to be more arousing. So mm. um, it's easier to think about a whole bunch of like really negative events, right? That we're really kind of like, we're really stressed. When there's positive, yeah, I, I can probably come up with a few, but it's it's not as easy. And so that's why, in fact, often people say, oh, I remember the negative better. But it's really because um, they tend to be the more like salient and arousing things. Mm. So that makes sense. So the more aroused an event is, the more likely you're going to remember it, positive or negative. Right. So help us further understand this idea of the optimism bias. Can you define it for us? Yeah. So it's our tendency to uh, imagine the future to be better than the past and the present and to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing positive events such as having a long, happy marriage, um, professional success, having talented kids, and underestimating the likelihood of experiencing negative events, such as mm. um, having um, an illness, uh, you know, getting COVID, being an accident, uh, getting a divorce, things like that. Yeah. And then so I have to imagine that having this optimism bias, it, it was something that happened during evolution so that we could survive. So how does having this optimism bias actually help us survive or helped us survive in the past? Hey there, Yap fam. Have you had enough of those complicated CRM platforms that seem like they're made for everyone except you, the salesperson? Well, say hello to Pipedrive, the CRM platform built by salespeople for salespeople. And I gotta say, Pipedrive is a real unicorn in the CRM world. They've got 100,000 clients already, a team of over 1,000 employees, and offices spread over eight countries. It's no wonder they've bagged six industry-leading awards in this year alone. You guys may know that I'm running the number one business podcast network. And my sales team is on fire right now. We are totally crushing. But here's the thing. Our old homegrown way of tracking sales using a popular database app just isn't going to cut it as we grow and scale. We need a real CRM platform for sales teams that's advanced, affordable, and plays nice with all of our favorite business tools. And guess what? I did a lot of research and I found out that Pipedrive fits the bill perfectly. It's geared to boost productivity for sales teams like ours. And ease of use is a big deal for us at Yap Media because we're busy. There's things happening right now. Now, and we don't have time to learn an outdated, clunky CRM tool. And if you guys know anything about CRM tools, a lot of them are really old and outdated and take like hours of training to figure out. But Pipedrive, on the other hand, is nothing like that. We gave it a whirl with a free trial. And after just one week, I was like, yep, we're moving all of our sales operations over to Pipedrive like right now. And I have to say, my sales team is loving it. And I think my favorite thing about Pipedrive is their insights and reports feature. They've got a very interactive dashboard and it helps us spot winning patterns in our sales process, which then lets us optimize our workflows and marketing campaigns. We do more of the things that are working because we're able to see what's working. And Pipedrive also keeps tabs on your performance like a business coach. It crunches numbers and calculates your average conversion rates. And then it tells you exactly how many new leads and activities you need to generate to then hit your goal. So basically it works backwards for you and basically doesn't allow you to fail. It tells you exactly what you need to do, how much input you need to put in to then make your targets based on your conversion rates. It's brilliant. It's so smart. It sends my team automatic alerts and reminders to keep deals on track. It also automates a lot of our admin tasks for us, like follow-ups, and it keeps all of our communication in one place. It is amazing. We've loved 
loved it since we started it. And I don't need to really be on my team's case anymore all the time. I don't need to always be sending reminders in Slack and making sure everybody's doing every little thing because everything is tracked and organized in Pipedrive. And Pipedrive is making sure my team is executing on all the things they need to do in order to close deals. And while it's been a short time on Pipedrive, I already feel like we're closing deals faster and things are just more smooth. We're working better as a team now that we're in Pipedrive. And if you got a larger team, Pipedrive's got your back with their power plan. It fits right between their professional and enterprise plans. It offers more flexibility, seamless team collaboration, and premium CRM features, including project management and phone support. And whether you've got two or three people on your sales team or 20 or 30 people on your sales team, Pipedrive can scale with you as you grow and is good for big and small teams. And like I said, it's really affordable, which is why I chose it because I imagine that I'm gonna have a 50 person sales team one day and I need to be able to make sure my platform can grow with us. So why wait, join Pipedrive, give it a try and smash your sales goals. You can try it for free for 14 days by going to youngandprofiting.co slash Pipedrive and you can get 20% off for one year. Again, for a 14 day trial, go to youngandprofiting.co slash Pipedrive and you can get 20% off pipe drive for one year. You can try the trial, no risk. This is exactly how I tested out pipe drive for my team. Give it a whirl, see how you like it, and you can get 20% off for one year. Again, that's youngandprofiting.co slash pipe drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so having these positive expectations of the future uh, means A, that your mental health is, is better because positive expectations make you happy, reduces stress and anxiety and so on. And mental health, good mental health is, is related to good physical health, right? Uh, less cardiac uh, arrest and so on. So that's one thing. The other thing, it like it enhances your motivation. If I think, ooh, you know, my podcast is going to be a huge success, you're going to put more time and effort into it, right? Because you think, oh, I'm going to get tons of, of people listening. If you think, well, no one's going to listen to this, you're not going to put time and effort. And it's a bit of, of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And if you think about it, you know, people with, positive expectations, they go out, they try to do things to get to those goals that they think I can I can reach. But if you think about people who have negative expectations, and a lot of time people with depression tend to have negative expectations, they think, well, I'm not going to get that job. I'm not going to, you know, find that um, relationship that I want. And so they don't try. They stay in bed because if I'm not going to get it, what's the point really? And again, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if mm. you think even about, you know, um, humans exploring the rest of the world, leaving Africa to go to explore um, other continents, um, they had to kind of believe that there's something there for them to find and something that's better than what they already have. Because that's, yeah. you know, anytime you, you leave your environment and go and try something else, there's this expectations, oh, I have something there for me to find that's better what, than what I already have. So that's the evolutionary advantage it enhances mm -hmm. your motivation, your mental health, exploration, um, and their also physical health. But of course, there's a downside, right? If I'm underestimating the likelihood that I will get COVID, the likelihood that I would get cancer, right? I don't take precautionary action. I am underestimating the likelihood of being in an accident. I might not wear a helmet when I bike. And so that can cause negative outcomes as well in the financial domain, right? I'm underestimating my financial risk. Um, then I might take more risks than I should. And th that's a negative part of it. So there's this disadvantage and also advantages, right, to balance out. So a lot of people kind of have been thinking for a long time, well, okay, yes, there are disadvantages and there are advantages. Probably the advantages overall outweigh the disadvantages. And this is why we have this bias. But in fact, what we have found recently is that we have an optimism bias, but not all the time. We mostly have an optimism bias when we're in relatively safe environments. Um, if we put people in dangerous environments, then they start changing the way that they process information and they are less likely to have an optimism bias. And if you think about it, that could be evolutionary advantageous because if you're like, in the jungle and there's lions all around you, you don't want to underestimate the likelihood of being eaten up. Um, mm -hmm. But if you, you know, relatively safe environment like you and I are in today, okay, it's probably not a bad thing to have an optimism bias, which kind of like moves us forward. So it turns out that the brain has this little switch. Put us in a very dangerous environment, it reduces the optimism bias. Put us in a relatively safe environment, it's like, okay, now it's, it's safe for us. Let's have an optimism bias. We're not necessarily 
uh, have correct predictions about the future. They'll be overly optimistic, but it could be helpful for us. Um, and I think that that is what was really advantageous um, and helped us evolve as a species. Yeah, and I'm really happy that you made that distinction because my initial thoughts when I was learning about the optimism bias was it was so different from what I've heard from other people who've come on the show talking about the negativity bias and how we're more risk averse and that's how we were able to survive and not get eaten by lions. So it's great that you mentioned that it's really based on the context, your environment, um, and then it can go up and down based on your environment. So speaking of it kind of evolving over time. How about as we age, how does the optimism bias change as we age? Yeah. And that actually takes us back to the same kind of idea of like when you're stressed, you have less an optimism bias. Because what we find mm. is that the optimism bias is quite high in kids. And then it starts going down, 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 gets to like minimum in your midlife. So people in their midlife almost don't have even the optimism bias. And then it starts becoming bigger again. So as we age, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it, it, it reaches quite a high level um, late in life. So it's a bit of a U-shape like that. Now, we mm. don't really know why there's a U-shape. But one um, hypothesis is that it's the amount of stress that we have in life. Because really, it's in midlife that you have the most amount of stress. You kind of have, it's the peak of your professional life, as well as you might need to take care of children and elderly parents. So there's a lot of stressors that are um, really um, salient in midlife that are less so um, in kids and teenagers and the elderly. It's not that you don't have stressors when you're a child and when you're older, but it's really uh, midlife that people at least report the most amount of stress. Hmm. And so a lot of people think of themselves as pessimists. How many pessimists are really out there, do you think? <laughs> yeah, so there's a huge uh, discrepancy between how someone views themselves and what they actually are. Um, mm. It turns out that we're not very good at assessing our own optimism. So we, um, more than not, I would say, people come in and they say, oh, I'm a pessimist or I'm a realist. Uh, but then when you test them, you actually have, like, do them the test and quantify it. It turns out that 80% of us have an optimism bias. Now, it doesn't mean that you're, if you have an optimism, you're optimistic about every single part of your life, right? I mean, there are, you could be, like, more optimistic about your personal life and not professional life or vice versa. But in general... 80% have an optimism bias. Then 20%, the rest of them, half of them have a pessimistic bias. So about 10% of the population in general uh, tend to underestimate positive events and overestimate negative events. So they are pessimistic. And then 10% of the general population tend not to have a bias at all. That mm. doesn't mean that they are good at predicting anything, right? So they have a lot of mistakes when they're predicting, but sometimes the mistakes are like overly optimistic, some they're overly pessimistic. It just cancels each other out. So really just about 10% to answer your question. Yeah, very, very little, which is I always thought it was like kind of 50-50 or something, but it's interesting to think that like most people are actually pretty optimistic. Let's talk about the difference between being individually optimistic about our own lives versus how we view the world. Yeah, so that's another really important distinction between when I say 80% of us has an optimist bias, it's really important to mention that this is true about our own experiences and our own life and our own prospects and perhaps those that are close to us, our children, our family. It's not about the world at large. So mm -hmm. in fact, if anything, people have a pessimistic view about um, issues related to like global issues, leadership in their country, you know, political issues and so on. All of these like social big issues, people, if anything, tend to be pessimistic. So we call this private optimism, but public despair. So mm. people tend to be, I will be okay. However, you know, the rest of us, not so. Um, <laughs> and you see this again and again, if there's like a market collapse or so, People think, okay, I'm going to be fine, but in general, the world is kind of going downhill. Even when you talk about like climate change, there are studies that show that people say, yes, there's climate change and it's going to have terrible effects on most of the world. But then when you ask about their own like little town, they, they think, oh, that is, we're going to be fine, right? We're not quite, there's always a reason um, why their little town will be okay, they will be okay. So, um, yeah, so when you go online and you see all these like very negative uh, opinions and so um, it's not um, about usually people's own right prospects, 
but about like the general uh, state of the world. Yeah. And I'd love to hear more about the pros and cons of this optimism bias when it comes to our own lives. So what are the consequences of having an optimism bias as well as what are the, the benefits of having it? Right. So I, I think the, um, as, as we say, the big benefit, it's enhanced your motivation, right? And and that causes you to kind of go out and try things, take actions, right? If you think, um, I can uh, get ahead and get a, a promotion at work, then you, you try harder and the likelihood that you will get it is greater. Uh, if you think, yes, I can find my perfect partner, you're more likely to go ahead and have lots of dates and stuff. And, you know, cause you try things, uh, rather than if you just have a negative, uh, view. And in fact, it's been shown that entrepreneurs tend to be more optimistic than the rest of the population. Mm-hmm. Um, which makes sense. They need to be, right? In order to, because because the chances of succeeding as an entrepreneur is quite low. And so you have to overestimate your chances in order to go out and put the effort and really, really try. Um, so that's really the benefit, as well as just maintaining good health. There is, in fact, a correlation between depression and pessimism. So mm-hmm. one symptom of depression is pessimism, right? So having optimism is is good for just your mental health. Um, and it turns out that um, people who are successful in all sorts of fields tend to be optimistic, whether it's in business, in academia, in sports. Uh, CEOs are, are way more optimistic than the rest of the population. So these are all the benefits. And then the uh, negative part of it is um, not taking enough precautionary action to protect yourself because you're underestimating your risk whether it's health risk, you know, whether it is uh, financial risk. If you, we underestimate it, then we tend to not take enough precautionary action. And so um, that that can put us in danger. And I think the, so, the solution that kind of I usually talk about is you don't necessarily need to, you do, first of all, you can't, and I'll explain why in a second, but you don't necessarily need to change your views. Mm. <laughs> you don't necessarily need to have negative expectations. And even if you wanted to, it's really hard to do that. Um, What you want is to say, okay, I think I'm going to be fine, but I know that there's an optimism bias, so I'm going to put in a policy in place to protect myself. For example, the British government has a book that they call the Green Book, which is recommendations for project appraisals, appraisers. And they say in the Green Book that there's an optimism bias, and because of that, people tend to underestimate how long projects will take to complete and how much they would cost. And I'm sure every listener can, you know, um, uh, think about such instances in your own life, whether it's in business, right? That happens all the time, but also in your personal life, you're renovating a house, always takes like 10 times longer than you imagine, right? You're planning a wedding, whatever it is, it always takes longer and always costs more. Um, And so in the green book, they say, okay, we, in order to um, try to correct that, We need to adjust all the budgets in the uh, British government for the optimism bias. And so the way that they do that, and for example, they did it for the London Olympics, they looked at similar past projects, in this case, past Olympics, looked at the predictions of how long it will take, how much it would cost, and then the actual how long did it take, how long did it cost, calculated the average bias, and then added it to their own um, hmm. estimates. So it wasn't, it was actually a very long PDF on how they do it. So it's not as simple as I described, but that's a principle of it. Um, so that's a great example. They didn't say, you know, change what you actually think is going to happen, but write, write down what you think is going to happen. Okay. Now go back and adjust it according to what we know from past experience is a likely error, is a likely bias. And you can do that by looking at past events that other people were involved in, like other Olympics. But also, if um, if it's something you're trying to correct your own estimates and something that you do mm-hmm. again and again, um, you could just re- have a record, you know, of this is what I think, if it's investment, right? This is what I think uh, the profit is going to be. And then later, okay, this is the pro- what the profit was. This is what I think. This is what the profit is. And if you do that enough time, you can actually see for yourself, okay, this is the bias that I usually have. Or like you're hiring people, let's say, you know, so you you write down your expectations and then like um, your actual evaluation of them after the fact and see what the error was. It's also helpful to see why did you have that mistake? Is Mm. it that you didn't have enough information? Is it that you were overconfident, right? So while making your estimate, it's good to also record 
what do I know at the moment, right? Which upon which I'm making this prediction. Um, how confident am I about in this prediction? And then later on, then you might be able to kind of pinpoint what is the source of an error and then correct it by pulling in a policy to help you. Mm. This is really great. It's really practical in terms of how to make sure that we don't have the consequences of the mm -hmm. optimism bias. But what if we're on the other spectrum and we feel like we're not optimistic enough? Is that something that we can change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it, it is possible to change to some um, to some uh, degree. Um, and one of the most common suggestions um, is based on studies conducted by Martin Seligman. Uh, what Marty Seligman did, he took a group of individuals who were pessimistic. Most of them did have depression to some extent, maybe mild. Um, and he trained them to think like an optimist. What does that mean? Well, one thing that optimists tend to do is they tend to um, evaluate positive events in uh, an optimistic manner. What does that mean? Let's say something good happened to you. You got a job that you really wanted. What the optimists tend to do is say, ooh, I got the job because of traits that are, you know, stable within me. I got the job because I'm really good with people, right? Mm. And so if I'm really good in people, that means I'm going to be good with people in the future too. So this means like I'll get more jobs in the future, right? And also it means not only will I get a good job, I'll probably have more friends. And so now they generalize it, right? So something good happens. They interpret it. It happened because of something that is personal. It's stable. It can generalize. When something bad happens, they tend to do the reverse, right? So you didn't get a job. They tend to say, well, it's not so much me per se. They happen to be a better candidate or, you know, I didn't have time to study for the interview this time and this is why it happened. And so what this means, it's this negative event has no consequences to other things in their life. They don't, right? And it's <laughs> like, well, I didn't learn for this specific one. I didn't study enough, but this doesn't mean that I'm going to not study next time. It doesn't mean that like this is going to affect how many friends I have, right? So they do the exact opposite for negative. So that's what Martin Seligman uh, trained these group of individuals to do. He trained them. Every time something positive happened, let's interpret in the, this kind of optimistic manner. When a negative thing happened, let's interpret it in the positive manner. Um, and his uh, data suggests that he was successful to some degree. They became more optimistic and as a result actually were healthier physically and mentally. Um, so less appointments uh, to the doctor and, and things like that. Yeah. Talk to us about how we learn differently, whether we're getting positive information or negative information. Right. So one of the um, reasons that we tend to have an optimism bias is what do we do when we have information in front of us, right? So this is actually what we discovered um, almost a decade ago now, I guess, um, which is when you learn something that's better than what you expected. For example, um, you think there's going to be like um, a million listeners. And I say, you know what? My data suggests there's going to be 2 million listeners. Um, then you quickly change your estimate and you say, oh, well, okay, in that case, you know, maybe 1.9, right? So you change it quite a bit because I told you something that's better than you expected. But if mm. you say, I think I'm going to have a million listeners and I say, you know, I, according to my data, only 50,000. Um, so this is way worse than what you expected. Um, then you would say, yeah, she doesn't really know what she's talking about. She doesn't have the right data. Um, and so you don't change your estimate much. You might say, well, maybe not a million, maybe 900,000, but you don't adjust it much when there's negative information versus positive information. So when we do this, we see this again and again. People learn much more. It's not that they don't learn from negative information. They do, but they tend to learn much better, quicker when they hear something that's really better than what they expected about their own prospects than something that's negative. And if you kind of walk around the world doing this all the time, well, that explains why you have these predictions that are better than what reality really is, right? Um, yeah. These kind of little shift in how you learn from the positive versus the negative causes us to have this uh, bias in our predictions of the future. And it's helpful to understand that because now when we come up with our own conclusions, we can kind of look at it with that lens and understand like maybe I'm being overly optimistic here and I need to pay attention to other signs or, or facts and data rather than how I'm feeling about it uh, internally. So let's move on to another topic here. You've talked about one of the ways to bolster optimism and better performance in ourselves is through positive feedback. So what happens in our brains when we hear something positive on something? 
Right. So the same kind of um, study that I just told you about, how we learn more from unexpected positive and negative, when we looked at people's brain activity while we were giving them information, we saw that regions in the brain were um, encoding information that's better than expected much more precisely than information that was worse. So when I told you, oh, 2 million listeners, the activity in your brain, we could use statistics and math to show it's really kind of registering the difference between how good the information is that I gave you and what you expected, right? But when I gave you information that's worse than expected, when I said only 50,000 listeners, the brain wasn't really encoding very well this difference between what you expected and what I gave you because you think that I'm not giving you right information. So your brain is like not bothering. This is like, you know, this is BS. We're not going to like, it's not encoded as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's what happens in the brain. And what this means then, it means that if you want someone to learn, if you want to, to, to give someone information and you want them to change your beliefs, you need to really think carefully about how you're framing the information, mm. right? Um because if you just give them negative information, like, oh, you're really likely to kind of, um, if you smoke, you'll get cancer. Uh, people are think, well, you know, I have good genes. My grandma smoked until she was 100. So they kind of discount this information. So you might try to think about how can I give people information in a way that will get them to where I want them to go, but can I frame it to highlight the opportunity for progress rather than decline? So for example, instead of telling someone if you take route A, you will lose time and money, which is highlighting the negative, you might say if you take route B, you will gain time and money. So highlighting what mm. needs to be done to get to the goal is just reframing. And in some sense, in fact, when we're giving people advice and stuff, we always that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to kind of get them to the positive spot, right? But a lot of times the way that we say it, instead of saying what you need to do to get to the positive, we kind of frame it as like, oh, don't do this. Don't do that, right? Instead of saying, this is what you should do, right? And it mm. should do to get to the positive. So that's a really like positive framing. And because we've seen that the brain does a better job at encoding this surprisingly positive information uh, and taking it in, then that is kind of a better approach. Okay, so if we want somebody to do something, we want to try to phrase in a positive way. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, if we want to deter somebody or to, to not do something, how do we frame it? Yeah, so th this actually relates to a whole different um, kind of phenomena that um, we've also saw, that there's this relationship in the brain because of how we evolved between expecting good things and action. So let's say I'm thirsty, I want to drink, I need to move my hand and drink, right? I need to take an action in order to get my reward, which is a coffee. This is the way life is. Often, to get what you want, you have to do something. I need a promotion, I need to work, right? I need, I need to go, um, I need want to eat that piece of chocolate, I need to go and I need to get it, right? To get the good stuff, you need to, to do something. In contrary, often, not always, but often, in order to avoid the bad stuff, you often need to just like not do anything, just stay, you know, away. So, you know, you want to avoid bad people. You want to avoid poison. You want to avoid deep waters. You need to kind of not do anything. Now, of course, not always, but, and also you can overcome this, right? But this is why, because of this tie between action and reward and not action and punishment, our brain has evolved to kind of tie these things together. And so now when we um, have a reward, it's easier to act to get it, right? And so that's why like to kind of motivate people, you with you want them to do something. You want them to work harder. You want your kids to uh, tidy up the room. You'll say, well, if you tidy up the room, you'll find your favorite toy at the bottom of the, of the pile, right? So you kind of highlight, this is a reward that you can get if you act. Mm. On the other hand, if we want someone not to do something, someone, your kid not to eat the cookie, then you might uh, threaten them with kind of punishment, right? Or if you want someone not to share confidential information, then maybe a punishment will be more effective because in our brain, you know, punishments are related to not action and rewards to action. Um, so that's kind of another thing to think about when we're trying to frame our message. Is it that we want people to do something or not to do something? But of course, I have to say in all of these things, these are kind of very broad mechanisms that we find when we look at how the brain works. 
we're kind of we're very um, sophisticated creatures. We can overcome all of this, right? So these are kind of the basic broad strokes that we should consider when we're thinking about how to provide feedback, how to frame our messages. Um, but of course, it doesn't mean that if you um, tell someone, you know, if you're not sharing confidential information, I'll give you some money, it won't work, right? It's just kind of these very broad principles to consider. Yeah. I'm curious to understand your perspective on like, let's say we're a marketer for like a government or something, and we're mm -hmm. trying to get people to wear their seatbelts. What what would be the way that you would recommend that they write their, their marketing messaging for that? Yeah. So there's, there's many um, different elements that could work. One is actually social information, what other people are doing. Um, that's very helpful. And people use it all the time, right? So th saying something like, 90% of individuals wear their uh, seatbelt when they get into a car, right? So that's very helpful. Um, and even better, 90% of individuals in your neighborhood wear a seatbelt. Mm. Um, and that's been used a lot. You know, if you look at, if you go to the airport and you put water in your bottle, it says, you know, 2 million people, 2 million 565, you know, people put water in the bottle today. So it's telling you about the good behavior of others. And that's really motivating. You're like, oh, you know, all these people are doing this good thing. You know, I want to do it too. I want to be part of the of the big number. Um, and um, so that's one one very helpful way if marketers want to influence what people are, are doing. Uh, another is um, progress monitoring. Um, so this is, people use this a lot with like health apps, right? Um, you know, like how many steps did I take today? So it's like, it's monitoring your progress all the time. And that kind of, it's rewarding. You're like, oh, I did like 10,000 steps today. Or like, oh, you do a few steps and you see the numbers go up. And that's mm -hmm. really uh, motivating for people. So um, you have that in health apps, but you can have it in a lot of different domains as well. I mean, you could imagine that every time, uh, like a device where you go in the car and every time you click the numbers go up, right? I mean, you can mm -hmm. imagine something like that. And also just like positive feedback is very helpful. So you can also imagine there is a device in the car and every time you click it, it says, well done, you did the safe thing, right? An automatic kind of like um, tap in the back kind of thing. So those, um, and what's helpful is that if those kind of like feedback, positive feedback or other rewards are immediate, you did something immediately, it tells you like, good job, right? Rather than like, you can imagine, I put the, the, belt in. And then by the end of the ride, it tells me good job, right? So that's not not great because it really to have to be most effective, you want um, a really strong connection in time between what it is that you did and the feedback that you got. Mm. Um, yeah. And a lot of these things are, you know, there are people on social media, social media platforms, you see these all the time, right? This is why social media is so addictive. It's because it's using all of these tricks all the time, right? It's show. It's like you put you post something, you get immediate rewards from other people. Um, it is monitoring the number. You can see the number of likes, and they go up, right? Um, you can see what other people are doing. So it basically is taking all these things that we know shape human behavior and putting it together in this like one platform. Yeah, it's so interesting that stuff. So I want to stick on this idea of uh, influencing people. How about hope and fear? How does hope and fear play into the way that we could potentially influence people? Yeah, so um, emotion is definitely uh, something that is important in the actions that we choose to do, right? We choose to do actions in order to feel good or to avoid fe feeling bad. And so if you highlight that to people, um, that would be um, something that can motivate them. As we said before, um, action is usually related with kind of an anticipation of reward. So if you want to induce action, kind of highlighting the hope, highlighting the goal is, is better. Um, fear, on the other hand, as we mentioned before, can cause freezing, inaction, right? Mm. I'm afraid of the deep waters. I'm afraid of poison. It causes me inaction. And so if you want to motivate people to act, to go out and vote, to put a helmet on and so on, then in fact, like, Highlighting the good that can come out of it is, is more helpful. Mm. Regardless of that, of just how effective it is, you also like need to consider, do I want really want to um, stress people out, right? Is it something that I really need to do? Is there's no other way? Because if you cause fear, that has you know a negative effect on people's mental health. So you need to think about, is this really worth it in this instance? Is there something else that I could do? Hmm. 
Okay, so let's talk about influencing others and get into some of the content in your book from the influential mind. So I think one of the most head-turning things that you talk about is how our brains are not wired to be very persuaded by facts and data. Can you talk to us about how people are not driven by facts? Yeah. So, I mean, we see this all the time, whether it's looking at things like um, uh, effectiveness of vaccines or climate change or, you know, there's all this data and all this numbers, but that's not necessarily what is uh, influencing people's beliefs. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense if we look back at, at you know, evolutionary perspective for most of our existence as a species, we didn't really have, we didn't understand like math and statistics. We didn't really have these kind of ways of putting together graph and, and like calculating the exact percentage. We, it wasn't something that we, at least not at this like big data kind of ability that we have now. And so the way that we really used to learn is we looked around at our little community, our little group of people, and just notice, oh, this person did this and, you know, now they're ill. This person did this and they seem happy. And so we take these kind of anecdotal, or we tell people, we hear, someone said, oh, you know, this person ate a berry and now they're dead. Uh, so we would take these like anecdotal examples and that's how we learned. Um, and it makes sense that, yes, you know, we have evolved and we can use numbers and so on. But our instinct is if you tell me a story, um, that is just like much more uh, impactful in general, or at least the first instinct is, ooh, I kind of like, I'm really moved by that. And a lot of times, one of the, the one of the reasons is that usually when you tell a story, it's about a specific individual and it becomes much more emotional, right? And if it's more emotional, I pay more attention, I'm more interested, and so I learn better. Numbers are usually a little bit dry. Um, mm. So even if you say, you know, 8,000 people got ill from drinking polluted water versus tell me about this one person. You know, Maria has two kids. She drank the water. She got ill. And so now it's like, I can imagine it. It's vivid. Mm -hmm. It like talks to you. It, it elicits emotion. And so that's why it's very um, impactful. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we don't want to have the data. We don't want to have the numbers. We want to have them and we want to share them. We just need to make sure that we are not um, relying on them, on the numbers and data when we're describing, when we're sharing to others only that, right? If we could add to that an example to just illustrate, that's always helpful. It's helpful in anything, right? If I describe my science, I can show you my graphs, right? Or I can give you an example, oh, how this relates to your life. How if you were, you know, if I give you this specific information, it's always uh, just easier for us to understand and therefore to remember as well. Yeah. Humans, we love stories, right? Storytelling yeah. is our favorite thing. So let's talk about how we pick and choose the information that we want to kind of consider when we're making a decision or determining a belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's always been the case that we don't treat all information equally and, and really we shouldn't, right? I mean, there's some more reliable information than, than others. And that means like, you know, who do we talk to, how reliable they are, but it, it really is, it became more clear now in the information age because we go online and there's just like an infinite n number amount of information out there. Like, how do I know what it is that I'm going to uh, believe? What What is it that I'm going to actually just read? And so it, I think it became, it became more of a problem, um, these biases that we have in how we go out to select what information to consume and also what in, what to do with that information. Is it going to change my beliefs or not? There's two really strong biases that we've seen in the literature. One is called the confirmation bias, which is our tendency to go out and seek and believe information that already confirms what we uh, think is true. Um, and this could be like, it can be in politics, but it can be anything, right? If I, if I have a, a belief and you're just telling me something that fits well, I'm like, Ooh, okay. Yeah, that t definitely works. I, I can see that because it fits what I really believe. Um, so that's a confirmation bias. We're much more likely to take in that information that confirms what we already believe than information that goes against it. The other is, um, called the desirability bias, which is a little bit like the optimism bias that I described, which is if I give you information that you want to believe. It makes you happy. It tells you something good about yourself. You're going to take it in more than information that, that's negative. 
And you're also going to go out and seek it. There's a really uh, great study that was that was done by free behavioral economists um, that what they wanted to do is see when do people log into their accounts to check on their stocks. And what they found is that in general, when the market was going up, people logged in more without any intention of making a transaction or anything like that. But um, And they could control for that. They could show it's like not with that intention. Mm. And the reason if is the market is going up, you're like, ooh, I probably gained some money and I want a bit of a sniff of the good news. When the market was going <laughs> down, people avoided logging in, right? It's like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know how much I lost. Um, and that was true as long as the negative information could be reasonably avoided. So, you know, when you do have like big falls in the market, people do then log in and start like freaking out. Um, and usually it's a bit too late by that time. But these like little ups and downs, if it's up, I go in, I'm like, oh, got some more. If it's down, it's like, well, I'm not going to look today. Um, so it makes sense. We want to, you know, in some ways it makes sense. We want to feel good. And one thing that makes us feel good is good information, good news. Yeah. And I'd love to, to actually ask you a follow-up question to that. Why is fake news so viral? The people who um, design um, these kind of uh, misinformation, fake news, um, they have a good understanding of psychology, mostly. They understand what type of information do people want and who wants it, right? So they can design that piece of news to make it more viral. They're like, well, let's mm -hmm. add this kind of emotion to it. Um, let's add, um, let's target people who in general, that's their point of view. So, you know, confirmation bias kicks in, desirability bias kicks in. Um, they can have... Um, other people who are like part of it try to like, you know, show that actually other people believe it. So they're mm -hmm. very aware of these things and they use them. And and so that is um, a problem. And I think regardless, a huge problem is there's just not enough um, incentives not to do that, right? Mm -hmm. There is not enough oversight. There isn't enough um, punishment. Um, and so people are just not incentivized not to um, go ahead and spread um, these types of uh, content. And so knowing all this, Tali, how can we actually protect ourselves a bit and think more rationally? Is that possible? I think the first, first is knowledge, right? To know about how your mind works, how you make decisions, how you process information. That's the first important thing. It's not enough, but it's a beginning, right? Now that you, you know about these biases, um, which you can learn from podcasts such as this, you know, books, talks online, um, is to think about, okay, how is this likely to impact my life, right? My specific job, my specific line of work, or, you know, something that's important to me in my personal life. And once you figure that out, then you can ask yourself, okay, is there something that I can do, a policy that I can put in place to protect myself? So for example, I bike to work, if I bike, well, it's, sometimes I bike to work every day, I don't always put a helmet on, right? And this is not good. <laughs> uh, and so I can say, okay, part of the reason I don't do it is I'm underestimating my risk. So how am I going to correct for this? I can correct for this with knowledge of other behavioral uh, phenomena. Um, so for example, I can tell myself, look, every time you get to work and you have a helmet on, you can give yourself an immediate reward because we just said immediate reward, super powerful, have a little chocolate. Um, every time you go to work and you don't have the helmet on, you have to give money to a charity that you dislike, right? So you kind of like a little punishment. So if we know these things, we could figure out what we could do to um, overcome the potential negative outcomes. Um, hmm. Or for example, you, you know that you want to work out, but you don't really like doing it. And also you're underestimating the negative impact of not working out. Then you say, okay, let's, again, we could use a little immediate reward. Every time I go on the treadmill, I will allow myself to watch some like um, kind of like reality TV that I usually don't allow myself to watch, right? So it's a little kind of treat that you get. So yeah, I, I think those are kind of the ways. The other really important thing to say is that it's a little bit difficult for us to see the biases in ourselves right? Confirmation mm. biases, our ability bias, like how much we're influenced by other people um, that after that when we're stressed, we kind of concentrate more on the negative and the optimism bias goes away. But we can see that in others all the time. I think now, especially now that we've kind of learned about it, you could kind of look around and it's like, oh, you know, they're not listening because that's like 
it's contrary to their belief or it's not telling them what they want to hear or like, you know, you can see this every day basically. Um, and so knowing about these kind of biases and how our brain works means that we'll be better able to at least frame information to others um, in, in advise them uh, using this knowledge. Because like, for example, as we said, you know, you want people to do something, maybe highlight the goal, right? The actions that they need to take. Don't like focus on the frets because people tend to discount frets. And so we're not only helping ourselves, but we can also help each other. So you have a new book coming out. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I have a new book coming out at the end of February 2024, so in a few months. Um, it's called Look Again, The Power of Noticing What Is Already There, and it's co-written with Cass Sunstein. It just up now on Amazon for pre-orders. Um, and it, um, it looks at this phenomena by which when things are kind of constant, we tend to see them less, feel them less, notice them less, so for example, let's say you have a wonderful career, which you do. And at first it was super exciting to have this like great podcast and, you know, but over time you kind of got used to it. So maybe it doesn't make you as happy as it did, right? So these positive, amazing things that we have in life, whether it's a wonderful family or a partner or a nice house. And so a job that we've always wanted, but then we get it. And well, after a while we get used to it. What was kind of thrilling on Monday is a bit boring on Friday. Um, and that's a problem because, right, it, it's, we're, we're not as like maybe as happy as we could be. And so we talk a lot about what can we do to make us feel these things again, uh, right? Notice them again. And then on the other side, it's also true for these bad things. There are some really bad things around which we kind of get used to it, like social media, right? A lot of like terrible um, way that people talk to each other on social media or like things around us that are like pollution, air pollution. There's all these things, but because they've been there for so long, we got used to them and we don't notice them. Now, on one hand, you mm. say, well, maybe that's good. So it doesn't make us sad. And it's like, it's good that we don't notice. But on the other hand, if you don't notice, you don't try to change. So then, you know, half of the book is about the positive. And then the other half is like, well, how can we notice again these things that we kind of got used to um, and we can't see, but how can we see it again in order to enhance change uh, to make things better. Awesome. Well, that sounds super fascinating. We'll definitely have you back on the podcast with your co-author to talk about that book. Um, so I end the show with two questions that I ask all my guests. The first one is, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? Well, one thing and I that they could do is write down what it is that they want, the one thing that they want. And it doesn't have to be huge, right? Um, and then write maybe like five steps uh, of how to get there. Um, so then, you know, you have a, a really specific plan. Now that's helpful for two reasons. One is you could follow the plan. But the second reason is once you have a plan, you, that makes you think that you're more likely to get there, right? It mm. enhances optimism. Um, and that means you get more motivated. So you've asked me like earlier in, in the podcast, like how do we get more optimistic? And, and I mentioned one strategy, but this is another, which is the, the re, if you kind of like think through, how am I going to get to where I want to get? It changes your prediction of your likelihood to get there because it makes me things more vivid, more detailed. Um, mm. And so it enhances your optimism and as a result, your motivation. And if it enhances your motivation, enhances optimism, you're more likely to take action. Ooh, I love that one. And what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond just financial. Um, okay. I think one thing that is important to me, uh, I definitely do it in my life. And, and this is something that we talk a lot in the new, in the new book, um, is change and diversity. And that, I mean, diversity in your own life. Um, so not mm. just being in the same place all the time, every year, like all year, you know, do whatever you can to change things around. Um, and it can be to different amounts. I mean, I actually kind of change locations. So now I'm in California, which I'm all, it's not where I live, but I spend like, you know, four weeks a year here. It's totally different from where I usually am. And that change in the environment means I feel things differently. I think about things differently, right? So it can be a change of that sort in your environment or just change in like the schedule of how you do things. Um, even just taking yourself doing the day from like the the um, chair that you usually sit in 
go sit somewhere else, go work in a coffee shop for an hour. Like that kind of change. There's there's a lot of data and a lot of studies showing that changes your thought process and is more likely to um, elicit innovative ideas. So diversify. Don't just kind of like do the same thing, all thing, all the time. Yeah. Even even if Makes it's great, even if it's great, just diversity alone um, is is kind of a component for a good life. Yeah, it sounds like it, it kind of inspires you to change environments uh, mm-hmm. from what you're saying. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tali. This was such a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed hearing all your wisdom about optimism and influence. Human behavior is one of my favorite subjects, so it was a real honor to have you on the show. It was a pleasure. Thank you for all your questions. <laughs> 